as we hear the word from Luke, the 11th chapter, verse 1 through 13. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as God taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door that has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks you for an egg, he'll give you a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? There's a story of a woman who had a parrot. It was a male parrot. That's important to note. It was a male parrot. And this parrot, she was so proud of her parrot, it was, it was her only companion in life was her parrot. And this parrot sat on the bottom of the cage all day long with his wings folded in prayer. And she would go to church on Sunday. She went to church every Sunday. She was a devout member of the church and was there every Sunday. And she'd, she'd brag to her Sunday school class and the congregation about her parrot and what a wonderful parrot she had, and how faithful her parrot was, and, and about his prayers that he prayed all day long in the bottom of the cage. Well, she was bragging one day about her parrot, and an older gentleman overheard her talking about her parrot, and he too had a parrot, a female parrot. And he came up to the lady, and he said to her, Hey, 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 I have this female parrot, and, and she is a terrible parrot. She said, my son raised her, and all she does all day is cuss. She cusses all day long. That's all she does. I mean, she's got to be the worst creature God ever created. But he said, I was thinking that maybe if I brought my parrot over to your house and let my parrot meet your parrot, maybe your parrot... Maybe your parrot would help my parrot stop cussing and start praying. Well, the lady thought, eh, this might be okay, so she agreed. Bring your parrot over. So he brought the parrot over, and there was, of course, the lady's parrot. There he was at the bottom of the cage with his wings folded in prayer. And the gentleman gently put, got his parrot out of the cage and put it on the perch inside the other cage and closed the door. As soon as he set the parrot on the perch in that cage, the, the male parrot's eyes came up. He jumped up on the perch. He looked the female parrot up and down. And he said, Hallelujah, my prayers have been answered. <laughs> 
Well, that's not exactly the way prayer works. But anyway, all kidding aside, prayer for us as Christians is a spiritual discipline which is central to us and how we grow as disciples. It's so basic to how we come to be shaped in the very image of God that we're created to be. Now, oftentimes with prayer, we get confused. Sometimes we just get intimidated about the whole idea of praying and what to say and, and how to say it and all those sorts of things. And so we, we struggle with that, especially when we're new Christians on our journey, but even when we've been on the journey a long time and we're in difficult situations. So these next five weeks, we're going to be exploring the master prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, the first disciples, to pray the Lord's Prayer. The prayer journey for the disciples begins today in the gospel lesson that Marilyn read a few moments ago. Here the disciples ask Jesus to teach them, to teach them how to pray, how they ought to address the Almighty God. And Jesus responds to this by giving them this beautiful prayer. He says, when you pray, this is how you speak to God. When you pray, this is how you speak to God. Our Father. Our Father. Now, some people I know have been offended that Jesus would start this prayer with those words. Jesus, in today's gospel, that he would teach them to address God as Father. But I think if that's what you're offended about, you miss the most offensive word. See, the most offensive word is really the little word, our, our. In this prayer, we are taught to pray not as individuals. We are taught to pray as family, as a church. When we say our, we're, we're not being possessive of God. No, we're not. This, this God will not be our property, okay? You're not going to have God as your personal property, you're not going to domesticate God in some way. People have tried that, all right. They've tried to make God the cheerleader for the American way. You ever heard anyone? Well, it's a political season, so you probably heard it a lot. You've heard them say that God's sort of like the, the Federal Express, if you will, delivers on our command. But that's not the way God is. God will never be our property. God is not our possession, when we say our, it's due to the astounding recognition that this God, that this God is the one who created the entire universe. This is the God who flung the stars into motion, the planets into motion into their course. The one who has willed to become our God. This God. This God reaches out to us. This, this God is the God who claims each and every one of us. This God promises to be our God, and this is the God that promises to make us God's people. There's more to this little word, our, than even that, though. We not only joyfully declare God is our Father, our friend, our, our, our Creator, we are saying our God when we say that, we are praying in the plural. Praying in the plural. It would have been a very different prayer, for that matter, if God had taught us to pray, My Father, give me this day my daily bread, and lead me not into temptation. But that's not the way the prayer is written. The prayer is written in the plural form. Now, a lot of religions may come to you through a quiet walk in the woods. Religions, other religions may come to you through a quiet reading in the library of some great book, or some may come to you through quietly rummaging through the recesses of your psyche. But Christianity doesn't come to us that way. Christianity is inherently a communal faith, a communal faith. A matter of life in the body, life in the church. Jesus did not call isolated individuals to follow him. That's not the way it worked. 
He didn't call isolated individuals. Last week, Jake preached on the calling of the disciples, and they, they came even in groups, and they became a group once they came together. He didn't just send them out one by one. They came together as a group, and they went out in groups. He called a group of disciples. He gathered a crowd. Think for a moment how you were called to be a disciple. Think of that moment, that time in your life when you felt the calling to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Was it something you just thought up all by yourself one day? I don't think so. Was it revealed to you by staring into the sun for 30 minutes until you were blind? I doubt it. Was it because you walked through a field of clover? Most likely not. No, most likely you're here because of a friendship you had, a relationship you had with another Christian. Someone had to tell you the story, didn't they? Someone told you that story, the story. Someone told you this story. They, they had lived the faith in such a way that you said to yourself, perhaps, I want to know more about this. I want to be part of that. Somebody had to walk the walk and talk the talk. That's how you came to be a disciple. Perhaps it was a loving parent who told you the stories or read you the stories, or just loved you. Perhaps it was a person you met at work or in school, or, or perhaps it was some other encounter you had with a friend somewhere along the way. The communal calling, though, is, is not an accident. It's not accidental at all. It's, it's the basic, essential component of the Christian faith. You see, the Beatles were right. We truly do get by with a little help from our friends. Because it's usually a friend who calls us, who, who gives us that invitation, who invites us. So every time we pray, Our Father, we are naming the way we became disciples. We are naming the way we were saved. We were saved as a group, into a group, uh, uh, as we prayed together, as we correct one another, as we, as we forgive one another, as we stumble along after Jesus together. That's right. That's what we do. That's what the church does. It stumbles along after Jesus. We don't always get it right. We step on toes. We, we do all sorts of things, but we're struggling and stumbling along trying to follow Jesus together. We try to memorize his moves. We try to memorize his moves and understand him until we become, his way becomes our way. Our way. Now, if you read the creeds of the church, go back there in the back of the hymnal. If those of you who are bored with the sermon can just go back to the back of the hymnal and browse through there. Every creed is written in the plural, except one. The Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, which I wish they'd written it in the plural, but they didn't. They wrote it in the singular. I believe in God the Father Almighty. And we live in a society full of rugged individualists, and sometimes that's real misleading for us to think somehow we begin to believe that this faith is mostly about me, myself, and I. But that's not the way it is. That's not at all really about what it's about. It's not a narcissistic faith, not Christianity. It's we, it's our. And so the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, taught them to pray when they first prayed, Our Father. When we say Our Father, we are certainly also challenging the status of family as is known in our culture. For those of us who learn to pray this prayer, our first family is shifted. Our first family is no longer our biological family when we pray this prayer. Our first family becomes those, those who taught us to pray. Our Father, the church becomes our family, our first family. So Jesus said in Matthew 23, 9, Call no one your Father on earth, for you have one Father the one in heaven. 
Call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the Father in heaven. God is the Father. Therefore, when we say family, we mean church. Christianity teaches us to look beyond our families, beyond our earthly families and all the limitations and all the dysfunction there, and to see our family membership now after baptism. Through baptism, our family has been evoked from all families, from all nations, from all races, from all cultures, to be the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And this is why you gather in church. And when you gather in church on Sunday morning with folks, you gather with folks that the world, by world standards, you ought not be here together. You ought to be perfect strangers, by the way, all of you. That's by the world standards. You shouldn't call these people brothers and sisters by the world standards, but yet we call each other brothers and sisters. Look around at your brothers and sisters. It's okay. And you're in the church. It's okay. You can look at your brothers and sisters this morning. Look at them all. Look at them all. We're all different. We could all be strangers. But God, God has called us all together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our Father has done that. Now, prayer is a problem for lots of modern people. Sometimes it's difficult. I, I talked about that earlier. It's difficult to know what to pray or how to say the right words or, or even if we will say the right words or if we'll hurt someone more than help them when we pray. or what, you know, what do you do with all that? Well, the beautiful thing is Jesus, when he taught the disciples, helped us to pray. He gave us this prayer, this prayer that we say from our hearts, that we know by heart, that we say out of habit. You don't have to work up some sort of powerful inner urge to pray. No, all you have to do is say these words by heart. Say these words from your heart, and then you're praying. Perhaps that's what the Apostle Paul meant in part when he says, none of us really knows what to say to God. You know, if the Apostle Paul did not know, could confess that he didn't always know what to say to God, then why should any of us expect to always know what to say to God? Fortunately, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and helps us to speak. In Romans 8, it says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Hear that. That's how the Spirit intercedes. When we don't have the words, the Spirit can intercede with sighs that are too deep for even our words to be able to communicate. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. God searches our hearts. And He knows what is the mind of the Spirit. And because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God, we don't always know how to pray as Christians or what to say. And when it comes down to it, if we're really honest, sometimes we don't even know how to act as Christians. Sometimes we don't know how to live. Sometimes, sometimes we don't even know for sure what we fully believe. But fortunately for us, what you and I know is not the main point. The point is that God has searched each and every one of us as His children. And God knows us. God knows us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has helped us in our weakness of not knowing. God is there to help us with His Spirit. God has interceded for us even when we thought that we were interceding for ourselves. God has done that for us. Oh, how much is contained in this little prayer, the Lord's Prayer. How much is contained in just the first word of this little prayer. 
You see, this prayer is not really as soothing as you might think. It's really a radical declaration of who we are from the very first word. And so I invite you this morning to join with me in boldly praying this prayer that our Father gave us. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.